Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and good afternoon. Hope you and your family are healthy and safe today in this uh, very exceptional circumstances. Thank you for attending this uh, webinar. Well, we thought it's a webinar related to some extent to uh, the pandemic crisis that we are in. But it's not only a, a COVID crisis, not only a Corona crisis, but it might also be something else. There is something behind that COVID and it might carry the name of Amazon because it will also be a pandemic. We see it as we see it in logistics now. You have to know Amazonization appears to be one of the most widely searched terms on the internet today. And maybe you've heard it before, and, but aren't sure what, what it means. We will help you with that. And we will try to make you understand how Amazonization will also affect logistics in the coming years. Now, I'm not sitting alone here, as you can see from the wide view. Uh, at a social distance from me, <laughs> I have the pleasure to have here Tom Simons. And Tom Simons is Senior Financial Analyst of the KBC Group. Tom, maybe just explain a few words, because most people know you from uh, radio and television and newspapers. So it is good to, to present yourself just in a few words. All right. Thank you for having me, Alex. It's a, it's a nice building. It's nice weather. So I'm pleased to be inside. Um, for the, those who don't know me, um, as my business card says, a senior financial economist, which basically means I'm uh, following up on all um, news flows and everything that happens on a short term financial basis. So everything that concerns trends, news reports, MA, everything that concerns uh, evolution of whatever uh, strategy there might be uh, is basically up my sleeve in that position. I'm helped with our uh, analyst teams of KFC Security Research, KFC Asset Management. So we're one big family. Uh, well, that's not unsimilar to what Amazon is like, Alex. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thanks very much for being here and share this moment with us. Right. Um, maybe just some practicalities. Uh, there is a chat function uh, on this webinar. And maybe just to check, uh, it would be good if all the participants could just mention their function or their sector they're in. First, it, it is helpful also for us to better refine um, to the needs of you uh, this, this, this webinar, and then we will see how the chat function works. So I'm uh, very uh, lo looking forward to what's appearing now on the chat function. Please do. Then, uh, OK, um, we have also a poll. And I would like to start with a, a very easy poll. It's one question that uh, you might complete. And uh, we will poll this again at the end of the presentation. So just fill out uh, or comp say what, what is your preference at now. And then at the end, we will try again to see whether we changed, you, we changed your opinion, let's say. Maybe I just wait a few seconds uh, while most of you are entering the poll. And let's, yeah, let's take a look at this moment. I'll, well, uh, I'll, I'll just inter intervene a little bit. Is um, I just get a feedback that uh, my, um, my camera is not being very fluently. I don't know if that is true. That's also something you might uh, post on the chat, some feedback that we can optimize our uh, visualization strategy. Look at this. Approximately 40% of the people are convinced that the big e-tailers will take control of logistics in the future. Some 45% are still in doubt and let's say uh, a small 20% yeah, is uh, saying no, logistics sector is for the current actors of the logistics sector and it will, it will remain like that. Okay, good news. That's a good starting point. Um, we come back to that later and uh, let's now look into uh, 
uh, what we have to say. Uh, maybe I'm not sure my, uh, my, my, my image is showing. Joost is uh, feeding it back. That is, there's no, no image. No image of the... Otherwise, I have to, to switch to my webcam. Anyhow, people can follow you from the, from the side angle. Okay. Okay. What is Amazonization? Huh? Amazonization is, is a term used to define and or let's say to quantify in some way the impact of a giant e-tailer on society and logistics and the way it dominates the industry. It is derived from the so-called Walmartization, huh? a term which used uh, in the late 90s to define the dominance of Walmart in the retail industry. Now, as said, and as we know, Amazon is setting the golden standard of instant product delivery nowadays. And with the Corona crisis, we saw that e-commerce has boosted. And the question is, in how far has this Corona crisis accelerated this dominance of Amazon also in the logistics sector? Because Amazon is, of course, dominating uh, as an e-tailer, but will Amazon also dominate the logistics sector? That's the question mark. And to better assess and uh, answer this question, it would be good to look from both sides to Amazon, from the logistics perspective and the future of logistics and how well Amazon would fit in that, but also from a financial perspective. And that's very relevant, as you will see. And therefore, I would like to give the word to Tom to lead us to the, 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 the let's say, the basic financials and strategy of Amazon. Please, Tom. All right. Thanks, Alex. Um, yes, thank you. I uh, will uh, need some, give some color on the finance, which is very important. And we will come back to that in the later stage of the webinar, um, because it's not only important to know what Amazon is like or how much profits they make, but essentially also why is it that they make these profits and uh, how, how uh, structural are they with a very close look at cash flows in the balance sheet. I will not go into too much detail because uh, that would lead us far astray, but it's nevertheless very important. On the slide, you can see the official mission statement from Amazon, which you've read by now. And it's a very good uh, sounding mission statement, but what it doesn't convey is the real meaning of Jeff Bezos, which he added verbally to that. And that's on the next slide. Uh, and it's basically uh, saying that uh, your margin are his opportunity. And that is what he's been doing all along ever since it came to the market in 1997. Uh, people have been questioning that, if that's real or not. But meanwhile, we do know that it's real. Every single margin is being squeezed. And by that, and that's very important to know, even today, Amazon is not only a company, but also a word in that it redefines the meaning of competition. Competition by nature is always being characterized from a financial viewpoint in um, doing better than your competitors, squeezing margins to some extent, but especially maximizing profits. That has always been the strategy at, uh, at all of the sectors that we cover. But when it comes to Amazon, that is not the case. Amazon has always, um, has always sort of disregarded uh, profits in order to take market share or at least to take uh, margins. And that's what we'll see on the next couple of slides uh, quite clearly. Um, while they come on my desk. Here's a flywheel, and that is basically the magic of Amazon. We should never disregard that. It's a very important one, because uh, what, what you can see is basically a flywheel in which you can step in at, at no matter where. You can start at lower prices, you can start at a lower cost structure. In essence, you basically offer something in which you have, and that is why I'm looking at the left-hand side, the lowest cost structure. This is very similar to, for example, what Ryanair is doing or Atlas Coco in its uh, segment. But uh, when it comes to Amazon, you have the digital strategy and you have the network effects. And once you have the low cost structure, uh, you basically are, are able to lower your prices. And then, and there is the magic, you insert the cash flows into the customer experience. What you can see here is the launch of Prime, which come back uh, extensively later today. Uh, but once Prime is launched and customers are happy, they're buying more. And once they're buying more, it generates more cash flows and it attracts more sellers to the platform. This is the classical network effect. And it is very, very important to really understand the power of Amazon and the reason why Amazon has become a family. 
much like, for example, um, Apple is. So we already have two lines, um, Alex, we have a line to, towards, for example, Ryanair and Apple, basically meaning that I would not say that Amazon is a different story per se, mm -hmm. but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely well-run story. Yeah. I've added uh, this very little slide from uh, Amazon.co.uk, uh, in which this flywheel is being translated to the real world, and I think it holds a lot of value, because I hope it's visible on the, on the, on the slides, it's very small and runs up until 2013. But you can very clearly see where Amazon has started, a uh, low margin, easy to, easy to transport stocks, and then all of your phase two and phase three towards durables, fresh goods, complex durables, and so forth and so forth. And this is basically financed entirely by cash flows, not by profits. And there's a big difference, which we will see on the next slide. So what I said uh, in the family before moving all uh, before moving to the to the to the dry financial data, um, this one for me as a financial analyst is very important as well because when people or clients talk to me about Amazon or whether we, we should buy the stock or not. By the way, I think you should buy the stock, but it's something completely unrelated to this uh, webinar. You see that the brand value of Amazon is very big, and again, enter the flywheel. Amazon is more than a, just a stock or a logistics provider, it's a family. And that means that you will want to order with Amazon rather than ordering, for example, at one of the competitive sites. So that basically means the brand value is, is, a, is a mirror of the execution of the strategy of Amazon. And that's a very important one in explaining why the profits and the cash flows are so structural and especially so high. We'll see on the next slide. Uh, this one holds more text. Uh, what I wanted to do here is give you some figures of Amazon, which are not financially, but which uh, sort of uh, describe a little bit how powerful Amazon has, uh, has gotten. Um, you can see, uh, and that's basically what I've been saying, the clients are very sticky. The prime customers, uh, and I'm just quoting out of the text here, the prime customers, they spend roughly 1,300 US dollars per year, almost double that of non-prime. And Prime basically means free, free delivery, free one-day delivery or two-day delivery, depends on and the television. Location. And television as well. Uh, again, it offers a, a broad family, so Prime is more related to Apple than, for example, what Alibaba, or JD, or Baidu can offer. Okay. So this is very important. If you want to add something to that, Alex, uh, go wild. Huh? I will do. Um, I've also added uh, some of the, of the shares, like the online retail share. It depends on the source you use, but still, um, Quite often it's being tagged at 49%, so half of the online reader share in US that is. So that alone totals um, around 260 billion, which is massive uh, to say the least, and which explains the recurring nature of, for example, the prime orders, and which explains why that is very important. Almost half of the internet users name Amazon as their prime products. I know this is not financial, but when it comes to assessing a business, it's always important to assess your clients first. Because a client that disappears tomorrow is not a client, he's a, he's a passerby. So we have already said that uh, Flywheel works, the family is expanding rapidly. And as you can see here on some of the high level data, the client is very willing to keep on spending with Amazon. And that basically means you have a, you have a very powerful group. Um, take note of the shipping costs as well in the total addressable market. Uh, Alex will come back on that one in a later stage of the webinar. But the total addressable mar market of Amazon as a whole, so that includes the cloud business, that includes the television, that includes everything, is estimated at around 3 trillion US dollars. So Amazon is a growth story and it hasn't yet shown its full potential to the world. This was a bit, uh, a slide with a lot more explanation. So let's now move to the financials um, and then you will know that Amazon is being fueled by AWS, which AWS, uh, I'd rather say, which is Amazon Web Services, and it's a peculiar beast. Uh, this explains the entire cash flow of Amazon, so I filtered that out. And you can very clearly see here on, the, on the, the screen the operating income that is being generated by Amazon in dark blue lines. Um, but if you subtract the, the, the operating income from AWS, Basically, if you look at the retail underlying operations of Amazon, then you will see that, well, it's not that big anymore. It generates around 4 billion US dollars of operating income, which is nice, but which is not huge. So um, 
AWS generates around 60-70% in the past two years of all operating cash flows of, of, of Amazon. And those cash flows, and now we're ending up and we're basically uh, combining the family with the client, um, client centricity and with the, uh, with the reinvestment of cash to what it's all about. That AWS is the very few, uh, supplies the very few of Amazon's retail strategy. So they're basically um, able to invest with a loss if necessary because the cash flow is coming in anyway from AWS. So this is huge. On the next slide, I have uh, a nuclear, I think it was the nuclear slide. Yes, nuclear slide with a lot of, uh, with a lot of uh, figures. But I wanted to run you through this because this is something that I really, really think is very important to know. But you can see your revenues and EBITDAs, which is basically, you know what EBITDA is, of course. Um, but I also um, put there uh, the return on capital employed, which should be the true measure of uh, value creation for any company, especially with rising free cash flow yields. So uh, take some time to look at it. I would like to just, if I can clear the chat function here. Which is the most important figure we should look at. If, if you say, okay, this is typical for that type of company, uh, what is? It's probably for Amazon today, you should look at the net debt line because that is basically the mirror of your cash flows. If you look at net debt line, you can see in 2017, Amazon had a consolidated debt position still. Um, well, actually it was, it was slightly net cash, but let's say, let's say it's around zero. But ever since, if you subtract the figures on a year to year basis, then you can see, for example, that in 2020, Amazon is estimated to generate free cash flows of 26 billion US dollars. That is 26 billion US dollars, Alex, after investing enormous amounts of money into its uh, e-tailing, into its fulfillment operations, into everything it does. So this is the mirror of everything you see. And how do you arrive at that? Then you can see the return on capital employed. It's, uh, it's a beast that, uh, that uh, hammers out earnings and returns of over 10 to 15% annually, despite people are saying that Amazon is not going for profits. So that's why I didn't mention profits here. I just mentioned cash flows and the, the reflection on the balance sheet. That's really a key. Eh? Not going for profit yes. is a key in the way we should look to Amazon. Indeed, yeah. indeed. It's a, it's a cash flow machine. The problem uh, is that, and it's very interesting in the, in the spirit of this webinar, if you look at the net debt, for example, Amazon is barely able to invest more than it currently does. Yeah. It's probably it's investing huge amounts now to cope with Corona crisis, but still, um, it's, um, it, we envisage that Amazon in the next couple of years will have to decide on doing, for example, its first buyback, which is a stupid thing for Amazon to do because it's been always investing in its network and its clients, but it is just generating too much cash and okay. it cannot distribute the cash into its own network. Now, if you compare this financial profile with traditional companies, are there some companies with whom Amazon can be compared with? These, these flywheel effects generally um, are visible with uh, Alibaba. It's a very clear yeah. one, which is the same sector. You also have Netflix, Facebook, and there's basically uh, companies that uh, have, a, have a relative low capital intensity. Yeah, and if you would compare this to Walmart, because I think Walmart is still number one in the world. Eh? Well, Walmart is basically becoming Amazon because it needs to. It's the biggest competitor on the ground in the US. Um, with that difference, that uh, I didn't include a balance sheet here on these figures, but Walmart would be more or less comparable, but it has uh, significantly lower margins. Okay. So this is a, actually it's a very good question. If you look at the margins, these are consolidated margins. Yeah. So you have margins of 30% at AWS and 3% at logistics operations. Okay. So that basically makes obviously a high margin, but it's supported by the highest margins and those yeah. highest margins are not in the hands of, uh, of Walmart. So yeah. Walmart would, would, be, uh, would be worse in terms of margins. Okay. Maybe just for you uh, attendees, do not hesitate to use a chat function if you would have questions. We will try to, to monitor that a bit and, and if, if possible, we will include your questions in, uh, in this talk. Um, Alex, I see that Joost has, uh, has asked whether all retail companies have to make profit and Amazon is able to, to leave. We will discuss it later. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, we will discuss it later. Good question. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Do the next slide, uh, Alex. I think I... Yeah, uh, yeah. that's the next okay. slide. Okay, yeah. sure, yeah. I also, I also wanted to add to that, uh, from a non-financial point of view, how Amazon works. Um, I've been working at KBC since 1998, so uh, a bit homegrown and very blue in the veins. But um, what we tend to do, and I started with a lot of companies that we follow up on from a financial point of view, they launch a product and regardless of its success, it's being pushed to customers. Yeah. Amazon, and that's why I added the challenge projects on the right side, also launch a lot of things, but they, well, they don't always score home runs. And they, uh, they for example, as you can see the Fire Phone tablet, uh, even Amazon Fresh in 2007, they made a lot of errors as well. But other than most companies, we see that Amazon is very quick in abandoning those before rolling out on a massive scale. Okay. So the success from uh, Prime and the web services is derived from the massive scale after it was proven to be correct, to be just. So I just wanted to add that and um, I don't, Maybe when we move to the next slide. Um, yeah, and that's the last slide from my point for the first uh, for the first half of this presentation at my end. I also added uh, a competitive overview on a geographical scale, on a global scale, and that's very important. Amazon is not a company that is pushing away everybody. It's pushing away the company that it wants to. 70 or 80% of its international activities are just limited to three countries, UK, Germany, and Japan. That doesn't mean they've tried to do better. They have tried to be active in, for example, China, but they had to abandon their uh, domestic uh, marketplace in 2018, simply because Alibaba and JD.com were too powerful, or we also know how the Chinese work. Uh, the Chinese defend their uh, territory by, well, you know, by being very political mm -hmm. in a way, <laughs> in a Chinese way. But still they had to abandon China and then they tried to conquer India uh, which led last year to the loss of Flipkart, which was basically also in the hands of uh, Sofina, to Walmart. And that's a very good answer to your question from a couple of, the, uh, of minutes ago, uh, Alex. Is Walmart sort of blessed same same structure? Yeah. Well, it does not, but it really sees that they need scale and they need global scale as well. Yeah. So Walmart took control of Flipkart, basically um, preventing Amazon from going fast there. Still, Amazon is growing, but they have to do it on their own strength. And then finally, Latin and South America, there's a sole market in which uh, Amazon has not been able to make its push despite political... Uh, Very surprising. Uh, yeah, despite its, the political uh, climate was open there. But Mercado Libre is a phenomenon in South America. We don't know that so much here, but they're uh, the largest e-commerce platform. And upon hearing or thinking that uh, Amazon would launch Prime and it's one day delivery, free delivery, they did the same thing there starting in Mexico and then adding Brazil. Okay. So they're the first mover there, uh, but to the debt rent, and that is very visible here on the slide, by doing so their margins collapsed. So they chose for Amazonization. Uh, yeah. They chose okay. not to make a lot of profits, but to, to, to re-inject the profits into the system. Okay. Thereby winning the territory, but losing the profits mm -hmm. in the short term. Okay. Well, uh, maybe to make the connection now to the logistics, well, Remember, Tom, I asked you in 2016 to make a presentation on a, let's say, leading logistics seminar. And at that time, you, for the first time, you mentioned that the e-tailers would take a very important place into the logistics sector. And I remember a lot of people in the room there were flabbergasted. They even don't believe you. Yes. at that moment and slowly this is now taking place i guess and and that's why at this moment also accelerated by the corona crisis we can come to such a amazonization uh, of the logistics sector and primarily in the states because we know that amazon prime and other services are primarily rolled out in the states but more and more and recently they came to the Netherlands, uh, they will distribute uh, in Europe. Now, it's good maybe now to understand the logistics part and the logistics perspective. And for a better understanding, we, we could start from where are we now with logistics? Well, logistics today, even though it is high time for logistics from a societal point of view, due to the corona crisis, eh, because we are an essential sector, we see still that logistics 
the sector itself remains squeezed between, on the one hand, the instant product delivery, uh, as we know it, and as it is continuously growing, up to 20% of all sales, and I guess recently it, it has grown in the, the recent month to much higher than 20%, of all sales are in fact e-commerce sales. And the consumer is, is a bit perverse, yeah? because on the one hand, when his smartphone uh, is out of action, he wants immediately a new one, and he wants to be delivered to be delivered tomorrow, or even in the next hours, if possible. But that same consumer, if in the weekend is walking into uh, the green, he says, oh, we need a more sustainable world. And logistics and transport is responsible for a major part of the carbon footprint. And suddenly they are pointing to logistics as being guilty for uh, being non-sustainable. And this is the way logistics is squeezed today. And the result of that is that trucks uh, are running sometimes more, even half more than empty, 75% huh? fill rate. One truck on, on, on four uh, is running empty. At least these are the numbers of 2009. I think it has worsened since. But what, how bad, whatever it is, the issue is that logistics is the result of, of that squeezing. And the result is uh, resulting in any kind of what we call capacity paradox. This means we have a shortage on one hand and we cannot fill the capacity on the other hand. So this is a, a continuous paradox, which is really uh, a threat for the future of logistics. Now, what, be, what will be logistics tomorrow? Well, if on the one hand you have a shortage, on the other hand uh, you have bad fill rate, then you should bring together more flows. Huh? Consolidation, clustering, bundling, sharing, pooling, all these kinds of stuff is required to get a better fill rate, to get a better utilization of uh, your capacity. And Taking this into, uh, into our minds, we know that the next step uh, of logistics is already known. And more and more, we see that the end game, as we call it, is converging towards what we call the physical internet. And the physical internet is a kind of translation of the digital internet that we have today, but then to transport and logistics. Remember, uh, in the early 80s and 90s, uh, the big IT companies like IBM and Honeywell, they had leased lines for their customers. And they suffered, in fact, the same issue that transport is suffering today. This means some lease lines were, were continuously in shortage, while others were have a bad fill rate. And all these big ICT companies once decided, OK, let's stop to play this game we'll put this all in one pool, all this list line, and we create a, a kind of net, which is called the internet, where we have a system of uh, nodes connecting with, uh, with flows, and all the nodes we put the telecom providers who will uh, drive the capacity of that network. And that was a start of the internet. Well, the, the future of uh, transport and logistics probably will evolve in the same direction. So this is the way to better uh, use and share the capacity of a network, that physical internet. Maybe for, if you're not familiar with the physical internet, I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. Well, imagine that you today, you have 20 pallets of your goods are now in Madrid and you want to transport them to Brussels. What are you doing? You just call your, your, uh, your carrier and say, okay, pick me up these 20 pallets and bring them, them back here. It will take him eight days uh, back and forth, Brussels, Madrid, with one driver. And there is a real chance that he will drive empty towards Madrid because there is a huge imbalance on Spain, as you may know. A lot of flows coming from Spain to these places here, distribution center in Belgium, a lot of 
let's say, production areas are still in the north of Spain, conveying this product to the distribution centers here in Belgium. But very few flows going back. On top of that, you also have the fruit in the fruit season, a lot of uh, fruit which is coming this way. Now, this is a traditional way of working. You, and the European Commission, together with a, no, a number of companies, which are allied in what we called ALICE, which is the Alliance of Logistics, uh, of logistics Innovation in Europe through Collaboration. This is a kind of alliance where believers of the physical internet ally themselves uh, and it, it, it contains also uh, the European Commission but also a number of other companies, major and, and leading companies are in there and they believe that the physical internet will be the next, uh, the next stage in, in, in transport. Well, Imagine that we are now with the same uh, example of the 20 pallets in Spain. We are now 2030 or later, and we are in the time of the physical internet. Well, what will happen then? Well, instead of calling your carrier to carry these, these pallets, you just enter your 20 pallets into the platform uh, for instance, and it's a, the, the platform of the community of companies between Belgium and uh, having flows between Belgium and Spain. So we, we group all companies uh, with flows between Belgium and Spain. They are in a community and they have a kind of platform. And then you put your 20 pallets in it. And then thanks to the Internet of Things and to the algorithms, we're going to look which capacity which is connected to that community. This means this community has a number of carriers which are connected to that platform, which have, let's say, which have a certificate to drive Belgian-Spain flows or Spain-Belgium flows. And so they are allowed to do uh, the transport. Well, thanks to the Internet of Things, we're going to look into that capacity, which capacity is available. It will pick up the goods, the 20 pallets, in Madrid. It will drive maybe up to a, a warehouse of the community in uh, Clermont-Ferrand. Then it will be uh, transferred to another carrier who will take the, 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 the second leg. And like this, uh, the leg between Brussels and Madrid will take, for instance, five, uh, five separate legs into one big trajectory. But thanks to the, uh, the gains we can make on driving time and rest times and the algorithm will calculate that, it can be even faster than it is today, right? Now, that just for you to explain the physical internet as being a kind of big network where we share capacity, it's kind of uh, sharing economy for logistics, we share capacity and we, we push all flows on the big axis in Europe because the underlying network is a so-called TNT network, Trans-European Network for Transport. And it's a multimodal network that connects all industrial and consumer sites in Europe. And by means of that network and by means of the, the physical internet uh, protocol, the network is used. What, what does that mean in, in fact? Well, uh, that as you are sending now an email through the internet, you don't know how uh, or the exact, exact trajectory of that, uh, that email. Huh? It can uh, use the way through, for instance, the US before it comes back into your mailbox. Well, the same holds for the physical internet. You have goods and they will end up at the place uh, you want, but the exact trajectory uh, you don't have to know because you know that the, the, the carrier has been certified to do this type of transport. This is just a few words on the physical internet and the, the future of, uh, of logistics, but it's clear that to set up this kind of uh, physical internet uh, protocols, you need the mental shift uh, because this means that Companies, shippers, yeah, with having to transport their flows, share same capacity, share sh same trajectories, and things like that. So this requires a mental shift. It is the same mental shift 
that is required if we do the sharing economy. If we share bikes, if we share cars, we have the same mental shift as if we would share uh, transport capacity. So it requires trust, but also at, uh, it requires a fair gain and cost sharing. So what is basically very important in implementations of uh, the physical internet in the future is that there should be a kind of neutral governance. Uh, so if you as a company, you want to participate in such a platform, for instance, with uh, other companies with flows between Belgium and Spain, then you share first your data. And you should, you should not be reluctant to share your data. You, should, you, 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 you know that it should be sh safe to share uh, that data. And therefore, the neutral governance is important. And also the role of a public authority can be very crucial in this. But we will come back just in a minute. Now, I will make now the connection to what is Amazon now doing? Well, if we just look to the facts from a logistics perspective, then we see that, and this is typically for Amazon Prime in the US, huh? it's now coming to Europe as we see in the last, uh, the last picture, but they have more than 70 uh, airplanes already in their fleet, more than 20,000 uh, trucks and trailers, 20,000 uh, vans, uh, and more than 100,000 electric vans. More rail capacity has been reserved in the last uh, months. They have um, chosen for more intermodal uh, 53 feet containers. And this is not just for bringing the goods at your home. No, they definitely want to control the full supply chain from click to doorstep and before. This means also their inbound flows. Otherwise, you don't need that inter intermodal capacity. Right? Moreover, the robots, you all know them. And now, since, since a few months, uh, they have landed, I think, in the, in the Netherlands to take also prime in, in the European context. So we are uh, looking for that. And maybe, Tom? Alex, um, you can add to that probably. Uh, there was a question uh, concerning uh, from Mary, uh, how does the physical internet account for very different product merchandise requirements? Temperature, non-standard dimensions, dangerous goods? Yeah. Or is the physical internet only about e-commerce? No, 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 no. Physical internet will do the same type of, or will process the same type of products and process the same type of transport as it is today. Eh? This means if you have a flow coming from from uh, Spain to Belgium, and you need a chilled, uh, a chilled or temperature controlled flow, then it works just as it is working now. Because basically, physical internet makes use of the same capacity as it is provided today. But in fact, it opens up the capacity, while today a logistics service provider is servicing only those shippers in its uh, portfolio, well, this is open up to all the shippers of a community. And having this opening meaning, means that we can much better uh, flatten the volume on the capacity, which is not the case now if you only have three or four or five customers with the same type of flows. So that's, that is, in a sense, the, the physical internet, it, it, it does the same as we are doing now, the same type of, uh, yeah, maybe just one exception. Thanks to the packaging that uh, should be conceived and uh, is, let's say, in progress in different projects, there is a kind of what we call PI packaging, physical internet packaging. This is a kind of uh, modular uh, way of packaging things, uh, all derived from the, 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 the standard, uh, the standard 20 foot, uh, 40 feet, 45 feet containers. You have some other modular sizes as uh, one fits in itself system. This means, and the, the rationale behind is that 
we we can start combining even small packages because you know today we have basically three networks we have the the full load network and full container network we have groupage or part part uh, partial load network and we have uh, the, the let's say the um, the parcels network now the physical internet aims at putting these three networks together thanks to the packaging because all packaging will fit into each other and by doing this for instance I give the example again of, of, of Clermont-Ferrand where the, there's an intermediary stop. Then your 20 pallets will come in a separate container, will, will be taken off your container, uh, your, your trailer and put on another trailer without opening the, the trailer. So the packaging is very crucial in the physical internet and will help uh, all kind of conditioning first, but also will open the degrees of liberty to combine with other flows because everything will fit in each other that's that's the idea basically of uh, that physical oh my give you the floor all right thank you um as you can see the slide currently uh, on the screen projects or pro at least uh, draws the market value of a lot of these uh, logistics plays but i took some big ones namely the chinese I took Walmart as well, uh, FedEx, UPS, and Mercado Libre. Now, uh, in this part of uh, the several slides that I've added, I want to very clearly show where the difference is. And it adds to Joost's question concerning, well, is it all my, is it, is it good that Amazon is doing what it's doing? It's more of a deontological question. So uh, what you can see already on this slide is how big Amazon has get. It's one of the trillion dollar companies uh, this is end uh, February data, I guess. Uh, but meanwhile, it's moved up uh, above one trillion dollars, so it's very big, one of the four companies in the world. Now, what I wanted to do here um, is just illustrate that in answering to Joost, um, well, one could ask if it's really feasible or correct that you run a, a non-profit or low-profit business with high cash flow, uh, cash flow being serviced by another part of the group. It is what it is and clearly Amazon not only is really redefining the definition of what is competition, as I said before, but it's also redefining the rules because in essence, it's just, it's being allowed to run a very low margin business because it also has a high margin business being AWS. And of course, having the network, which uh, for example, uh, draws in a lot of advertising revenues as well, which uh, for which low capital, uh, capital intensive, uh, uh, capex is required so yeah it's not i don't think it's wrong for amazon to do so i just think the regulator needs to find an answer but yeah. the real question is here how do you compete with a company in your sector that generates its cash flows from outside outside the sector that is the real question for example i just made note of google is also being held by youtube um, youtube is a giant cash generator but it's there, but it also helps Google in, uh, in attracting uh, the, the, the advertising flows, for example. Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, same thing there. Is it allowed or not? And so right now, we are very convinced that Amazon, Google, Facebook can no longer do acquisitions from that scale. So that was an error from a regu regulatory point of view. Today, one can ask if Amazon is really running a, a loss in its retailing operations. It's not generating high margins, but if it's running a loss, one can debate. It's a CFO kind of question. Um, Netflix is also running huge losses with negative cash flows of over billions and billions per year, but it's being allowed to, to compete with Disney as well. So very difficult question. It's a very fair question, but it's a deontological one. Um, I don't have the answer. I would say it's, um, it's, we just let Amazon become too big become too powerful and the problem is that Amazon knows it and it's very uh, very savant mm -hmm. in a sense. so uh, but okay let me move on to my presentation here as well for the couple of slides uh, I'm going to very clearly try to draw the difference between UPS FedEx and Amazon and uh, by doing so I hope to uh, to paint a very clear picture for the future of the classical logistics uh, operations uh, you move on to the next one yeah okay it's not, uh, not that much. I think it's uh, roughly four, four slides, something like that. Wow, Alex. 
Well, first of all, uh, it's a logistics control freak. So very briefly, a couple of, uh, of data that uh, I and Alex amassed. For example, um, the percentage of own volume handled um, has risen from 15% in 2017 to over 50%. And then you already know that a lot of the, uh, the extra flows, the growth, has not been translated onto your distributors, but well, it went into the own network, which explains the, um, the pictures that Alex made on the number of trucks, vans, and even engines. But also in 2018, it was very interesting. Um, Amazon did extend its, its contract with FedEx, for example, for the ground shipping transport. Um, Alex, you, uh, you have something to say on that one in five minutes as well. But on the same year, Amazon also extended its network of its own delivery drivers under Amazon Flex, mm -hmm. which was a very clear indication that um, a contract extension doesn't necessarily mean uh, a friend extension. Yeah. So uh, it's probably something I think, Alex, maybe you can comment already on that one. Um, was that something that was written in the stars, no good, or was it a normal way of working? by expanding your own network whilst also making use of other ones that way? Or is it just a reflection of growth? I, I think it's a, it's a temporary phase, uh, preparing something different. That's, that's my view on things. And uh, well, the problem is that, and you talked about uh, the regulation and the regulator. Well, I think more and more this will become a very crucial function because no one can stop these giants from growing by using the let's say the opportunity in one sector and putting it as an opportunity for growing in another sector and, and what we see is that amazon is becoming and i'll give back the word to you but yep. is becoming let's say the biggest 3PL, not because they want to be the biggest 3PL, but automatically they will become the biggest 3PL because they are the biggest e-tailer and they will disrupt yes. at, by doing so. Really? Okay. I'll move on. Thanks for the uh, intervention, Alex. Um, there was a question from Hans that you might answer later. Uh, um, what you can see here also adding to the control freak that is Amazon um, and whether it should be split yost is a very good question. We, made, we might want to take that uh, off track on this webinar. Let's have a call later on. I think uh, if you would want to split companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, that you do a very clear regulatory, re regulatory thing. But um, yeah. But that will come back. That will come back, yeah. So we'll come back. To, yeah. um, as to the question of Mark uh, van der Hagen, eh, and that adds to the slide here, that the, tradi the, the traditional logistical service providers do not profit from the increase of online retailing. That is exactly what I wanted to show you. First of all, as you can see here, uh, and you will have read through the slide already, um, the fulfillment costs, they're, well, they're sky high. Eh? From Amazon, it's not coming cheap. So the one-day delivery, free one-day delivery, is, uh, well, to be a little bit impolite, but it's a pain in the financial ass because it costs a huge amount of money. But as I said, it is, it is um, cementing your clients onto your network. That is the family and the flywheel that is working. So you invest now to have the clients happy, to have the clients um, ordering to the tune of $1,300 per year, as we saw with Prime. It costs a lot, but once the costs are disappearing, the flows will continue to come in. Hence, the profit at that time will, maxim will be maximized. On the next uh, slide, um, we will go to, uh, to UPS and FedEx. Alex, if you wish. There we are. Now, these are three slides, and I would really want uh, to take a good look with you at those slides. What I did here was just um, offer you a view while I'm trying to remove the chat from my screen. There we go. Um, yeah, there we go. You can see the EBIT, the EBIT and the EBITDA margins. I prefer the EBIT margins, but they paint a general picture. I've uh, compared them between FedEx, UPS, and Amazon. Very clearly, you see in the startup phase from Amazon, uh, which was 1997 for its uh, public appearance, that they have been struggling with getting the, the margins up and above 5%. It took almost uh, eight, nine years, until 2004 or five, to get it at five, but then moving it higher was a little bit difficult. What you can also clearly see on the graph at Amazon is the very huge amount of investments they have to do between, say, 2007 and 2017. And you can see very clearly the dip in EBITDA uh, because of rising, uh, rising depreciation costs, hence 
uh, high capex into uh, real assets. Meanwhile, FedEx and UBS have, been, have had higher margins, so it's not that Amazon on a consolidated basis is the better of FedEx or UBS. So this is a very, very important thing to note. The uh, logistics yeah. retailers are not profiting indeed from online retailing, but their margins, although at FedEx they're, they've become, they came under pressure uh, recently, but they're, they can compete with Amazon on a global scale, that means including AWS. On the next slide, I've painted the same picture for the three companies, but I focused on a different uh, metric and it's still showing on my screen, here we go. What I did was projecting total cash flows on the left-hand side of the graphs and uh, on the right-hand side, the cash flows in percentage of total revenues on the right-hand side. So uh, what you basically look at now, and if you can focus on the dark blue lines for UBS and FedEx, you see the total cash flows has been increasing. And I think that is basically uh, a little bit the reflection of the increase in online retailing sales and e-commerce, uh, but it has worked for Amazon as well. But very clearly, look at Amazon uh, cash flow total between 1997 and say 2015. Um, they very clearly see that the total cash flows were very low, but they've expanded very, very rapidly. And of course, uh, the question is, is, it's a bit comparing apples to pears, but well, in the end, that is what Amazon is doing. It is competing in a different uh, volume than FedEx or UPS or any of the logistics providers are working. And it's the same way why Yoast uh, correctly is asking, uh, is this fair? Um, but it is fair because they are on the same grounds. They're using the same trucks and vans and they're shifting uh, yeah. goods, right? But they have a basic volume it that is. no one else has. Voila. And that's a guarantee for their Voila. margin. If we look forward, the, um, before we move to the next slide, what we really want to know is how powerful Amazon is, if, if Amazon is competing in, in Europe and they're not in Africa, which was also a question. Uh, because simply there's no scale to, to be held there. So maybe that's a uh, loss of the line. Same thing as IB Inver, for example. But if you really check, and I've made it a very big chart here, if you look at the free cash flow generation, and that is the magic of a company like Amazon, which we see in the digital sphere as well, but also in the non-digital sphere. But then you can very clearly see that the real difference between Amazon and all of its competitors, but virtually all of its competitors, including Walmart, is that it's generating huge amounts of free cash flow which means that all of your capex is being uh, being financed by existing operating cash flows, and you have a, a, a very big excess cash flow, which at this time they cannot uh, filter out, as I as I said in the previous table, but which is sitting on the balance sheet, and that is what I wanted to show you in the previous slide in the slide uh, from uh, 20 minutes ago that Amazon already has net cash positions of over 80, 90 billion euros or dollars, and it's increasing to the tune of $30 billion a year. So the, the beast is unleashed. Now the question is, are they able to use their cash and their excess cash in order to fund European growth in the competition with e-tailing uh, logistics? Is it feasible? Yes. Is it good? Should we, should we allow that? That's another question, of course. Um, I think this, uh, um, these were my slides. Again, I really wanted to show you how important it is that Amazon is generating cash flows that the competitors are not. Mm -hmm. So they're doing the same thing, but they are able to make mistakes yeah. and they can pay for it. Whereas if FedEx makes a mistake, well, it yeah. costs them dearly. Uh, well, I think, and, and again, we should stress the major competitive advantage that Amazon has and which UPS and FedEx does, doesn't have. And that is that Amazon has basic flows, their own flows, eh? as said, approximately 50% of their own flows are now operated by themselves. They have, as, as we showed, they are now expanding their fleet in the US. And they are now also offering 3PL-like shipping services. This means they have capacity in their fleet, which they do not use with their own flows. And they offer this to other competitors, or no, not competitors, can be competitors, but also to other uh, shippers into the market. And this can be competitors because they can say to other e-tailers, look, use my transport, use my warehouses, and I guarantee you the best possible services because it is the 
type of service I have. I'm an expert in this. And I can offer you that at the best possible price. Because nobody can, can go under the price of Amazon in this case, because it is, let's say, at the marginal costs. They have their own flows already, while UPS and, P, uh, and FedEx do not have any of these flows. Right? And this is, is really a huge competitive advantage. This is where the family comes in, huh? Right. It's not only about having the flows, but also securing future flows. Absolutely. And by being the biggest e-tailer in the world or becoming the biggest e-tailer in the world, automatically, they might become also the biggest logistics service provider in the world. And very recently, and it is from the 8th of April, uh, it was published that temporarily the 3PL services of Amazon which is in a kind of test or beta version only offered to a restricted number of uh, shippers, so a restricted number of companies, has been paused. Nobody knows why. There is no good explanation for that. But I don't know whether uh, it is, let's say, anticipating on some regular regulator uh, statements yeah, or one something of the like risks, that. One of the risks for Amazon is a political one. Huh? They're uh, having been very friendly uh, or at least not yeah. having been uh, welcomed in Washington. Um, that could certainly explain uh, why it's being done. The paradox of the political problem of Amazon is that all of their problems with, uh, with, with the White House recently have now proven to be incorrect because of the, the US needs yeah. Uh, Amazon, so, but it clearly, for me, this is political. This is the main yeah. problem at their end. Yeah. And that uh, also answers to the, the potential splitting up of the company, as you said. Well, th this, this is, in fact, uh, very crucial. And if we look, again, to the consumer, he is part of the family, and the family offers all type of services, including the logistic services. And he's the first logistics company having all the information about the end consumer, knowing all his behavior that, yeah, as a consumer at a certain point in time, you are trapped. Uh, doesn't need to be bad because it's, it can be very convenient. But the question is, uh, are we going to accept this uh, in Europe? And the Corona crisis has even boosted this dominance of the e-tails in Amazon because it's all-time high. I hear, I, I heard that Amazon is very close, very yeah, close. Yeah, okay. But same thing goes for Alibaba and all of the big ones. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. Now the idea, of course, with with Corona is that it will put again more societal pressure also on logistics and. As we said, the globalization of logistics might be turned into a more yeah, globalization, and eh? so that companies will look for a good mix of local and global uh, pushed by Corona. But at least the the drive uh, for more sustainability also in logistics will continue and maybe again also accelerate it. Well, at a certain point in time, logistics will be pushed into physical internet concepts, which are in fact the, the, the most sustainable concepts uh, that we can think of at this moment. So I guess that at a certain point in time when Amazon will be pushed into those sustainable concepts by its own consumers, uh, its, own, uh, its own users, then they might say, okay, we can do that. We can move to such a kind of physical internet concept, but I, as Amazon, I'm big enough to implement the physical internet on my own. I don't need those neutral governance models because I'm the leader. Most of the flows are my flows. A vast majority of the fleet can be my fleet. And so they can implement the physical internet, eh, the more sustainable way of doing, doing uh, logistics by using its own 
commercial governance, which is opposite to what we have in mind here in Europe, going to more neutral governance to arrange that physical internet. And by doing so, the control from click to doorstep will be even yeah. more bigger than uh, we, we thought it, it, it would be. The question is, how can this come to this, uh, when it comes to Europe, how will we react? And the question is, what should we do? And you talked on also about the regulator. Well, I think at some point there should be some regulation and yeah, companies like these giant retailers should be pushed to a split, not combining or not making use of their basic volumes into their logistics operation to become as such one of the biggest logistics operation. The question is, are we willing to do so? And is there a sense of urgency? Uh, is this perceived also by, by European Commission today or other regulators? It's a very good question and I'm very happy to hear uh, on the chat uh, the answers of the panel, of course. The problem for a regulator has always been when it comes to Amazon, but not only Amazon. Again, you also have, for example, uh, Facebook or, or again, Alibaba, Tencent, JD, Baidu. If you have a free platform, you don't charge for the platform. But for example, like Facebook, you charge via advertising yeah. and you keep everybody happy. You do not have a detrimental effect on the consumer. So normally you act as a regulator to prevent problems to the consumer. But now the consumer is happy. The yeah, consumer is happy, consumer. but as you very clearly illustrated, the problem is if Amazon has got its own physical internet, it's able to just notch up its prices by 5%, just like that. Yeah. And then what? And then you can go back, but everybody's hooked to Amazon. So that's clearly a problem. That's clearly a thing. So splitting it up, from a financial point of view, very interesting to hear what the panelists, or what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what um, the audience, what the audience would say on that one. Yeah. The problem is, it's such a well-run company, and it's they're doing it so good. They're actually proving that they're better in doing business than anybody else is doing that in the business. So it's a it's a bit of a harsh statement, but by doing their business, by optimizing their business structure and their uh, management of capital and operations. In, why should we punish them for being so good? And I'm not saying we shouldn't punish them. That's a different question. Yeah. But their, their success is derived from doing things good, not right. So this is a, it's a really difficult one. Okay, I relaunched the polling. Please give your answers back. Then we will compare how they are uh, evolving towards... There's also a chat. Yeah. Well, maybe we can, meanwhile, we can look at, uh, at other questions from the chat. Uh, I see here a question from uh, Bart asking, would the Amazon model work into a B2B context? Yes, definitely. And as I showed you, they are into intermodal. And this is definitely the B2B context, because this is not uh, doorstep transport, so to say. Huh? So they are, uh, yeah. It's, it's an old industry that they are putting in place. And uh, yeah, B2B definitely, uh, I think they already do this now uh, with their, most of their suppliers. So uh, yes, but there is no reason why it should not work. That's clear. Also the, on the question of breaking up, um, it's just very difficult to, to if you would not, have AWS and Amazon retailing operations in one company, I still think Amazon would be best in class. Yeah. Well, it's too late already, but I still think they would be. Yeah. Because they, they're very shrewd and savvy. And to be honest, uh, and I've seen a lot of Belgian companies as well, that will be very political in this one, but a lot of companies have had long traditions and have not modernized uh, as Amazon has done, of course, of course, if you, yeah. but maybe uh, it's just, maybe Amazon is a symbolic wake up call for old companies. Yeah. And if you cannot face the Amazon storm, maybe you are not ready to face yeah. it. The question remains, should we stop this or should 
Are yes. regulators and public authorities stop this or not? Well, we might also yes. think about, uh, I don't know how we can do that, Alex, but uh, in, as I said, Mercado Libre was able to fend off Amazon by itself. The problem is we do not have any European companies anymore. So we yeah. maybe should, uh, instead of fending off Amazon, create a European powerhouse. Maybe that's something I'm not very into the sector yeah. enough for that. But can we create a European juggernaut that can answer to Amazon by having scale, by having flows, and by having your own physical internet? Well, the question is, or maybe uh, we can uh, do it differently and create the physical internet uh, by the support of the public authorities, Hello. setting up the environment and allowing companies to go into this and collaborate and become as such much bigger than Amazon. And that probably maybe would, that's be, a, that's a... would be the best way forward. And I, I know that some companies in the commission is, is thinking of this anyhow. Right, if we look to the poll, uh, to put it in the US format, the nays have dropped to 13%. So I think we, um, wait, I, I, I show you the polling. I, I was just showing on my screen, share results. The, as you can see, the nays has dropped to 13%. So I think we succeed in uh, convincing some of you Still, the yes are very strongly uh, and dominating now. Almost 60% are convinced that Amazon might be the disruptor of the logistics sector in the future. While still 30% of you one third is in doubt and uh, is waiting. Right, uh, I think we are very close now to the end of our webinar. I hope uh, we have answered most of your questions. And just, maybe uh, just one last yeah, question. Tom. One last. Uh, yeah. It's uh, from Philips. Uh, the reasoning behind Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods. It's a very good question, and it resonates throughout the uh, presentation. Um, they're generating so much cash. Whole Foods at the time was very big. I was just checking how much they paid. I thought it was like a couple of billion, eight, nine something billion US dollars, but it was a playground. All, of, all the things we see today are the result of the Whole Foods acquisition. How do they indeed move from the, uh, from the digital to the physical world? And Whole Foods was just peanut money for, uh, for an, in, for an um, I'll say that, an, 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 a, a means to an end, uh, an experiment, so as you might call, and then see what comes out of it. As I said, Amazon is known to, to kill new products when they don't work. Well, they could have done the same thing with Whole Foods. If they're not, they did kill a lot of groceries in the real time and distribution in non-core cities. But uh, right now it's working. And I think Whole Foods is the physical emanation of the yeah. physical internet that you were talking about. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's Great. my two cents. Now you can uh, round you. up, Alex. I'll, I'll close. Thank you very much, Tom, for being with us and having uh, shed your light on, from a financial perspective on Amazonization and the logistics sector. We were, I think, we were a good team uh, to, <laughs> to bring this uh, presentation. I would like to thank all the participants for uh, their attendance. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget if you have any other questions, you can always uh, ask us directly via mail. We will be happy to respond to your questions. I hope you, uh, you enjoyed it. And I think the slides will be made available too uh, for you on the website, but you will be informed of that. Thanks again and uh, stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye.